Welcome back to the show, everyone. Of course, anytime you make a list, there's going to be some exclusions and some inclusions that cause just a little bit of controversy, and that is true with our next guest. But boy, what a great effort. It is called 100 Cult Films, and we're joined now by UBC Film Studies professor Ernest Mateus. How are you? Hi, Ernest. Very good, thank you. So good. tell us about your list of 100. How does one even begin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took about 10 years. Uh, we started in 2000 when uh, my co-author Xavier and I met at a conference, the first academic conference on cult cinema. And we met over breakfast the day after the conference and we decided that what we need is a list, an authoritative list of the top 100 cult films. Now this becomes a difficult subject because just trying to figure out what exactly cult means is, is a whole hornet's nest in there. I mean, because it doesn't exclude box office success necessarily. No, it doesn't. Um, Usually the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> it is usually the opposite. There are a few films in there that belong straightforwardly to the mainstream, but most of the films in the book you would call marginal cinema. Yeah. Now we've got on the cover, we've got Divine. John Waters, I think, is a choice that everybody would probably agree he belongs on the list of 100, but I have to start with one I was surprised to see, Lord of the Rings. What constitutes a film like that as a cult film to you? It was a massive box office success, um, but even within the popularity of the Lord of the Rings, there are pockets of fandom who celebrate the film beyond the bounds of moderation. Right. <laughs> or normalcy. <laughs> or normalcy. And that creates Absolutely. the cult like status, right? I never even thought of it that True. way, right? I mean, you know, theme party dressing and, and people who really believe in the mythology. And Tolkien, I mean, the mythology behind yeah. the whole story is... It's, it's a religion. So the, the, the term cult seems to be made for that kind of uh, obsession from fans with The Lord of the Rings. Okay, nice. We're going to get into a few that you've included on the list uh, that we wanted to talk about. The first one is Begotten. Uh, tell us about this film and, uh, and sounds really the weird. inclusion on the list. <laughs> it was a struggle to get it on, onto the list, but we wanted a few films in there that are examples of the unseen cinema. And Begotten is certainly an example. There are only a few copies of the film that exist. It's very difficult to get hold of. And it was made in a non-productive uh, fashion. So it's a, it's, a, it's a gem in itself. Now, uh, this would explain why I hadn't ever heard of it before and I was trying to feign knowledge about no, this. No, but, but this is your list of five that we're talking about right now are some of the most bizarre, one yep. would say. Okay, let's move to The Room. Uh, tell us about uh, this film. It's the second most recent film in the book. Um, it's from 2003, and it's a classic example of how a film that has no redeeming quality whatsoever <laughs> can be turned into a cult film simply by the fandom. <laughs> and it's, it's the way in which fans across the globe, and particularly in Vancouver, where yeah. the film has a rabid fandom, celebrate this film and, and, and turn it into something that the film could never be on itself. Is and it possible for modern day films, I mean some people argue this, to e cult films to even be made these these days? Is right, with distribution and you yeah. know, all that other. Some, some producers tried to make a cult film on purpose and it usually fails. Snakes on a Plane is a good example. It's right. like trying to make a viral video. Exactly. Right. The ones that happen are by accident. Yep, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, but it's fascinating what uh, I would think is a subset to this, what people attach themselves to. Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's the gore, sometimes yeah. it's the clothing. Genre. Uh, but the, all those elements don't have to be in it necessarily, do they? A combination of all of those. If it's something that's unhinged, if it's something that looks unfinished, which is certainly the case with The Room, because everything about the film is pretty much unfinished, then it's something... <laughs> It allows the fans to complete the film and it gives them some power over the film. Because they're and always fighting helps. over how the film should be completed, so this one leaves an open door. Anyone can make a better film than The Room, and that's, that's the pleasure of it. Perfect. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Tetsuo. Tetsuo. Um, Tetsu is a particular kind of science fiction film that entertains the idea that the human body and technology can match and mix and something strange comes out of it. It's a little bit like David Cronenberg's films, yeah. but a little bit more extreme even than that. And is it well done? I mean, are, are there special effects or are there special effects? There are many special effects. They're cheaply made, but they're incredibly well done up to the point that even today, the film's more than 20 years yeah. old, it's still extremely unsettling. Well, and that's the fascinating thing with some of uh, the films that you've included in there as well is, is yes, they're cult status, but the influence that they've had on filmmaking, on visual effects on just the creative process are really interesting because they have massive ramifications. They have massive ramifications and in a way they steer the future of cinema because their impact is so over time has become so big that they've become a model for modern cinema. Okay let's talk about do I say it Hexan? 
Hexen or Witchcraft Through the Ages. Okay, this sounds fascinating. <laughs> I prefer Witchcraft Through the Ages. Tell us <laughs> about this one. It's the oldest film in the book. It's from 1922. It was, it's a semi-documentary about superstition and uh, witches' Sabbath. And the director is actually in it. He plays Satan. He does. Now, 1922, I mean, how does something like this even still exist? It was very unusual at the time, and it still is. It, it took the film decades before it surfaced. It was banned and cut yeah. wherever it was tried to, tried to be screened. And in 1968, it resurfaced in a reduced version with a voiceover by William Burroughs, who, who gave it this thundering this, yeah, the narrative. Timber. Exactly. Uh, and it's because a lot of these films deal with cultural taboo. I mean, yep. that's another big part of it as well. Mm -hmm. and that's a great example. Is and Hexen deals with the persecution of those things that fall outside our, our, our realm of normality yeah. and how those things are prosecuted. Okay, the one film that I've seen in our list of five bizarre films is Videodrome. Best Canadian uh, film ever. David yes. Cronenberg. David Cronenberg, a man who makes a cult film whether he intends to or not. I don't know. <laughs> Every Probably movie true. is yes. bizarre. Uh, Videodrome, tell us why you chose this one. Videodrome is in the book because of all the David Cronenberg films, I think it's the most prophetic. It's a film, everything, everything the film deals with has become true. Yeah. I remember when I see it, when I saw it when I was younger, I, it, it was one of the first VHS or beta tapes I ever watched. Yeah. It scared me so much oh, and I yeah. didn't know why. It's very unsettling because it takes to the next level the idea that the media manipulate people. Yeah. And it takes it to the point where if media is manipulating to its messages the way we think, maybe it manipulates our bodies and we grow tumors that are the result of those manipulations. And once We're again, all Teletubbies. Uh, dealing exactly. with a, a social moral <laughs> conundrum that, that people may not have even known existed until this film cued the thought in their it, head. Yeah, it's, it's a speculation. I don't think Cronenberg knew what he was getting onto at, at the time, but yeah. a lot of it has actually become true. Amazing. Now, we quickly want to talk about Videomatica and what's happening with all uh, the movies that we thought were going to be lost. They're going to be at UBC? They're going to be at UBC and at SFU. Now, how many films were in Videomatica's library? Uh, we're still counting because <laughs> we have to match the database to what to the actual discs and tapes, but I think we're talking about over 30,000 titles. So these will be catalogued and at the university. They will be catalogued and they will be at the university's library and part of them will actually be uh, accessible for the public. Oh, that's, that's fantastic because nice. it was such a piece of history Great that legacy. could have just been lost. Absolutely. It's part of the cinema legacy of uh, Vancouver. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so Ernest, much. You. If you want a great coffee table book yeah. that will start a lot of conversations, pick up 100 cult films. It is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and start working your way through those films that you can actually get a hold of <laughs> and maybe UBC can help you with some of that. You can pick up the book at your local bookstore and you can find more information at cultmovieresearch.com. Uh, just a great resource for finding out some things that you should probably have a look at just to uh, blow the mind a little Thanks bit. Thanks again. We're going to take a quick break.